I'm Fabian, and today I'll be demonstrating how to remove uh, cloud providers. Sorry? Thanks. <laughs> how to remove cloud providers uh, from the zero trust equation. So I hope you appreciate my cloud native view on rather like low level security concepts. Um, I'm a security consultant with Control Plane, so we mostly do like pen testing um, for like uh, regulated industries, so it'd be like finance or like healthcare and so on. Um, as for myself, yeah, I'm a security consultant. I, I enjoy working mostly in like automation, so CI, CD stuff, DevSecOps -Sec kind of stuff. Um, and I like to automate everything, not just the, the boring stuff, but also the hard stuff, right? Because we don't want to do this every time and remember how to renew our keys after one year or stuff like that. <clears throat> so, quick little agenda overview. Um, first, I want to start with a bit of motivation. Uh, I like to play with shiny tech as much as the next guy, but <laughs> it's good to understand uh, what we're actually trying to achieve here and also when to apply certain concepts. Um, then we will dive into confidential computing and what it has to offer and like usual um, implementation steps on how to achieve zero trust. And then we will do a live demo of basically an extension I wrote for the Spire project that utilizes, utilizes confidential computing primitives. All right. So to get you a bit of engaged, like who has used like confidential computing primitives here in the room? Nice. Okay, so lots, lots of opportunities to learn here. Um, okay, obligatory XKCD, because every talk has to have one. Um, so in case you want to deploy anything right now on like a modern digital infrastructure, this is basically how your infrastructure stack looks like, right? There are so many components and the number is only ever increasing. And this comic alludes to the fact that there are some components that are more critical than others, right? So basically the whole internet is built on curl. Um, but at the same time, we can take a different spin on the same problem, right? We want to reduce just the number, the total number of components that have a direct effect on the stability, but also security of our system. So if we look at the current cloud native infrastructure stack, right? I, um, as like the end user, just want to rent a virtual machine and deploy like an authorization service, for example, to enable my zero trust environment. Um, I need to rely on all these yellow or orange boxes, right? To get their security right, to get their patching right. Because of all of these boxes have a direct impact on the stability and security of my system, right? And this is not always visible to the end user when I rent a VM from a cloud provider, I, I don't see the cloud management software where they have written to enable all of this nice and, and shiny automation internally. And then at the same time, also the hypervisor has direct access to the VM, it's, it's spawning in the end, right? So if the hypervisor is malicious, has a backdoor, or is just used maliciously by the cloud provider, right, they can directly get access to my VM. And this holds true for the whole stack down, right? Down to the BIOS and even the CPU and firmware. If someone gets a backdoor in there, it's game over for my stack on the top. <clears throat> so what's our goal here, right? We, we want to deploy an authorization service in the cloud while minimizing the trusted or the number of trusted components. And we also verify or want to verify the number of components we choose to trust and in the end, then finally achieve a um, zero trust system. So how can confidential computing help us with achieving this goal? So first things first, for folks who have not yet dabbled into confidential computing, every like area in tech right, has these three-letter abbreviations you need to know, so you're an expert in the field. So if you want to become an expert in confidential computing, let's learn about these. So confidential computing, uh, relies on something that is called a trusted execution environment. And that's basically any old environment that is somehow additionally hardened, usually enforced via the hardware. So for confidential computing, trusted execution environments, they usually have the benefit of memory encryption and memory integrity protection. So that every actor outside of this TEE is not able to view the data we are currently working on, right? So if we assume like, host system with like VMs, everyone outside of this confidential VM is not able to snoop in our memory. 
And then the second important concept is the concept of a trusted computing base. So these are basically all the components uh, that have a direct impact on the security of our system. And we will see later that we can reduce the TCB quite a lot by using these concepts. And then the third concept that is quite important but often neglected in like introductions to confidential computing is the remote verification part. Right? And this helps us to put the T into the TE, so the trusting part. Uh, we want to remotely verify that this is actually a protected environment and comes from like genuine hardware or a genuine vendor and only includes the component um, it, it advertises. So I will only give like a five or ten minute intro to confidential computing. I've given a talk two, two years ago at the Kubernetes community days, not so far from here. So if you want to check out like a deeper dive, go there. All right. Um, yeah, but some folks might point out now, right? So we have trusted execution environments already. Why not deploy our trusted service there? So I, for example, have worked in the past with hardware security modules. And of course, we could deploy a web server on an HSM, but that gets quite expensive. These things are like 10K a year or up, and are usually used to store like private keys of like certificate authorities and so on. So the, the, the very crown jewels. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have trusted platform modules. So each of one of your systems has a TPM installed, and these are the opposite, right? They're quite limited in the capabilities. They can store like a key or a few and perform very basic cryptographic operations, but usually no general purpose computing on those things. So very difficult to run a web server on these. And then there are also smart cards, right? Because you want to have your credit card and stuff protected. Uh, similar limitation, right? Very few um, computing capabilities, but it gets even worse because they're usually proprietary. Each vendor has different SDKs, so you would have to recompile everything, and again, the compute power is not there. And in any case, like no one runs their web server from a smart card. Uh, okay. So what happened in the space of confidential computing so far? In 2015, Intel in introduced something that is called SGX, or enclaves, uh, which is process-based isolation. So you basically take a single process from your operating system and move it into one of these memory encrypted environments. Right? This comes with all the benefits of having like a very limited trusted computing base, right? Only the application or the process you move over um, is able to yeah, act in that protected environment, but it comes with all the downsides as well, right? You no longer have an operating system. So <laughs> that usually requires you to recompile your whole application or like a different environment. You need to use different SDKs. So that's very difficult for most, most folks out there. All right, a few years later, AMD started um, to publish something that is called SEV, and this takes the whole virtual machine as the basis for isolation, not just a single process. So AMD released, um, I think, three or so different incremental improvements. So SEV is Secure Encrypted Virtualization. They started with basic memory encryption, but no integrity protection, and then they continuously improved it to also include the CPU registers to be protected from from the outside world. And now with the latest um, iteration of SNP, they also have memory integrity protection and a lot more. Um, yeah, the white paper is actually quite readable. So if you want to dive into the topic, I can highly recommend the AMD resources. All right, then Intel did what, what, what Intel does. <laughs> they waited five years and then did the big, big bang release on like everything that AMD worked on and like, incremental releases, and it took like the full feature set and just dropped it like two, two three years ago. Um, but still, it took a bit of time, right, to get support for these new CPU features and like the kernel and the hypervisors and so on. So really now, or like the last like six or 12 months, are a great time to get into confidential computing because it actually is available in the major cloud providers. It gets more and more support. It gets more and more like the tooling and plumbing you need to actually make stuff happen. All right, so let's remember the stack we had before, right? So with confidential computing, 
Let's assume our virtual machine is the trusted execution environment and it's completely shielded from the rest of the system. Even the hypervisor is no longer able to read the memory contents of our confidential VM. So that gets us a long, long way to reduce the number of, of co components that have a direct impact on the security of our system, right? The cloud management software, so the cloud provider, is actually no longer able to look in, uh, into our VM, right? which is quite magical, actually, to rent out a piece of hardware and they're not being able to, to look into it. So the only two components now we need to trust is the CPU, of course, because it enforces all of the stuff, and then certain parts of, of the low-level firmware. And then at the top stack, right, we are responsible for then deploying a hardened, hardened operating system onto that VM. All right. So let's dive into like how this works for AMD SNP. It looks somewhat similar for TDX, but again, only limited time in, in one talk. Um, so this is a different view, basically, of the same chart we had earlier, right? So only the AMD hardware is trusted in the SNP VM, so the guest we are interested in launching. All the other components, like the CPU, BIOS, like external devices, like none of these are able to mess with our VM, or if they try, we at least notice. Um, in addition, it's interesting to notice, like, there is a special chip, the security processor on these AMD chips, which is responsible to enforce most of this. So let's take a closer look on how the creation of a VM works, right? So the hypervisor is still responsible to carry out the launching of the VM. It's just not able to like look into the memory contents. So while the VM is launching, the AMD security processor I highlighted earlier is, is watching that that SNP guest and is continuously measuring the memory pages. So it basically builds like a fingerprint of the, of the whole boot process. And this not only includes the memory contents of the SNP guest, but also certain parts of like the AMD firmware and the microcode. So all of the different components that are involved to, to spawn that VM and have an impact on, on the security of it are actually measured and we will have another slide on how this looks in detail. All right, so once the VM is spawned, we as the guest owner, right, so guest owner on the right-hand side, this is us with our trusted laptop, we can now query it to give us an attestation report. So this is basically a document with a lot of meta information about the boot process, in including this measurement, which is signed by the AMD security processor. So it's a trusted document if tr someone tries to mess with it while sending it to us, right, we would know. So we as the guest owner can now make certain assertions about the security of that VM, right? Um, yeah, we can check if it has like a certain like level of firmware, like version level of firmware, or like certain security um, vulnerabilities patched out already. And then the measurement is probably the most important part, is like has someone tried to inject like a backdoor into our operating system or stuff like that. So it would show up here. So then we as the guest owner can decide like do we want to accept or reject this VM? And only if we reject it, right, then we should place trust in it, put the secrets in it. A bit like a TLS connection, right? You want to verify that the server is actually who they claim to be before you send encrypted information. So how's the verification performed, right? So this is usual X509 certificate stuff. If you're familiar with TLS or whatever, uh, should be quite familiar to you. So AMD has a root key, which is stored offline, probably in one of these fancy HSMs I mentioned before. And this, this is the root of trust, right? It is used to sign um, subsequent keys that in the end are actually used for, for certain operations. So there are AMD signing keys. These are the ones that are in the factories. And then the, the last key is the chip endorsement key. This is the key that's actually baked into your chip uh, that the security processor is using to sign the attestation report. So each of those keys signs a certificate about the next one. So if we get the attestation report, we can basically just walk up the chain in reverse, right? check that each, each signature checks out 
that it was by the correct previous key. And then we know that this attestation report must have come from genuine AMD hardware. So inside this attestation report, there are a lot of information. And I only want to highlight two, two data points, uh, just for the sake of time. Um, so the first one is something that is called the secure version number, or SVN. Anyone getting flashbacks when they hear SVN? So <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> this secure version number contains stuff like uh, the bootloader and the operating system, yes, for the security processor, um, but also stuff like the firmware version or like the version of the x86 microcode. All of these are bundled into like one big uh, version number and then reported to the end user. But they're not just reporting a single version, right? They're reporting three different ones. And I think that's actually quite clever because as a cloud provider, you need to set, satisfy a lot of different customers, right, with different update cycles. So they report three different version numbers. One is the current one, so that's basically the latest to which they have updated. And then there's the reported one, which can be lower. And this helps customers to incrementally update without being like forced to update today. Um, but at the same time, we want to make assertions about the security, right? A certain firmware level has patched out certain class of bugs or security vulnerabilities. So there's the last version, which is committed, and you can't downgrade this chip below this committed value. So you have this sliding reported window and then these fixed outer boundaries, which is quite nice. All right, and then last bit, how are these measurements um, created? If we zoom in into this, this chart real quick. So during launch, right, if you want to access memory, you don't access like this one byte of memory, you access a memory page. And every time these memory pages are used, like the security processor observes this process and is basically measuring these, these pages into one single digest, into one single register. So if we look how this is calculated, right, you take the previous value and you append the memory page contents, but also the metadata, and then you hash it again. So you continuously hash into the same register, and in the end you get one fingerprint. Right? You can't calculate back, of course, what was in the memory, but if some, someone tries to like, sneak in something during boot or changes something, yeah, this, this would show up. Okay, now, now the big question, like how do I get this measurement? <laughs> okay, I get this magic value reported in the attestation report. What do we actually compare against? Right? So what you can do when you're just starting out with confidential computing is tofu, it's trust on first use, it's not great, but at least you get something out of it. So this helps you to, to make an assertion of whether something has changed in your boot process, right? You, you remember the first value you get, and afterwards you, you keep it, or you check that it stays the same. If it doesn't, you know someone has changed something in your boot process. Obviously not perfect, but it gets you some benefit. Um, of course, if you're further on your confidential computing journey, there are tools out there that help you to basically pre-calculate this value. Most of these are basically built on like QEMO or like virtualization stack, stacks. So you can um, locally compute what measurement you would expect. Of course, for that to do, you would need all the inputs as well, right? You need the operating system and the firmware and so on. So, and vendors are getting better at open sourcing this stuff. So AWS, for example, um, open sourced a lot of the low level stuff not so long ago. All right, so that be it for like a quick intro into confidential computing. Uh, now we take the other tool stack that I was using, so Spiffy Inspire. Who has heard of Spiffy Inspire? Quick show of hands. All right. So what, what is zero trust, right? One of these nice buzzword, buzzwords getting thrown around. Uh, but it basically boils down to like never trust and always verify, right? Like in a like 90s network architecture, if you want to call it that, right? Once you're past the firewall, you're basically trusted at this point, right? Once you made it through the big bad thing, um, you're free to do whatever you want. And this is obviously not good security, right? What you want to do is like carry the security context of like who requested something and which machine is then carrying out the request to then also authenticate and authorize subsequent requests, right? 
this gets even worse and like a very distributed microservice approach where you have lots of different services but also like a very deep like call stack if you want to call it that so instead of just trusting right we want to verify that this machine is actually allowed to access this database and this gets potentially very difficult right if you have very heterogeneous environments. So if your application spans not only like one cloud provider, but also on-prem or like a second cloud provider, and like edge devices, it's very difficult to get all of these different workloads and identity so that you can actually make assertions um, about who wants to request something. And Spiffy is, a, is an open standard or a framework that helps you to basically give identities to workloads. Right? If you're just using one cloud provider, like if you're locked into AWS, they have tools for you. But if you have one stuff that, that works across cloud boundaries, um, you need something more, more general. And the general architecture of, of, of Spiffy is very simple, though. So you have one server, um, which is like the brain of the whole thing. And it um, has the capabilities to decide whether something is allowed to join your trust network. right? Um, and so that you don't have to implement every time like joining this network um, by yourself, there's the so-called agent. Right? This takes the, the communication. So if we look at the box below, right, this gray box, for example, could be a virtual machine we rent from the cloud provider. And then the agent reaches out to the service and says, hey, I'm a new VM. I would like to join the trust network. And the server then checks certain assertions uh, that the agent is making, like I'm a VM in AWS, I have this IP, here's like a document proving this stuff. And if the server says yes, then the agent is allowed to join. And then the agent subsequently helps our workloads to get identities, right? Once the agent is allowed to join, this whole context is considered trusted. <clears throat> All right, my, f my focus was only on this one arrow. <laughs> yeah, so very slim. Um, of course, the, the, the Spiffy server or the Spire server itself should also be hardened as much as possible, right? Because once you can trick the Spire server, you can just join like any, any old machine that you control to this trust network. There are other guides out there, and you can also probably use confidential computing to harden it additionally. But I only looked at like how can the agent use uh, confidential computing hardware to make stronger assertions to the server of whether it's trustworthy or not. So let's assume we're running on AWS, right? How is an agent usually joining this trust network? Um, so on AWS, there's something called the instance metadata service. So this is hosted at a known location, at a well-known location. And each EC2 instance can just query this to either get dynamically information about itself or also request one of these instance identity documents. Right? So AWS here enforces that only like the correct EC2 machine can request this document about itself. It includes like metadata, like which IP, which account, which, I don't know, region and namespace and all this good stuff. And then in the end, it's signed by AWS. So not so different to the attestation report we saw in the confidential computing space earlier. So this is then the workflow, and this is already built into Spiffy Spire, right? So the agent fetches this identity document, it sends it over to the server, and then the server is able to verify it by verifying the signature, but it can also talk to the AWS API and say like, hey, do, do you know about this machine? Does it actually exist? Like, does it exist in my account? And if all of this checks out, like the, the token is issued and the agent is allowed to join the network. Right. So we can now make assertions like only like agents from like a certain account ID are allowed to, to join this network, for example, right? We don't want anyone with like a valid AC2 instance to join, but we can like write a policy, like only agents with like this account ID or like only from this zone and so on are allowed to join. All right, so the proof of concept I have written um, extends now this AWS-based uh, flow, 
with the extension that we not only get this identity document, but we also ask the AMD security processor to also give me an attestation report. And then we send this to the server. So the server can now use basically two documents to make assertion about this instance, right? We know that it runs on AWS, but we also know that it's running on like memory encrypted hardware. And we then as the, as the workload in the end can make sure that, that only very trusted, very hardened workloads are, are accepted to handle requests. All right. So the red piece is, is, is the extension part, right? So the agent, again, fetches the document, sends it over, but then the server not, doesn't respond directly with like, yes or no, you're allowed to join or not, but it responds with a nonce. Right? So a nonce is like a random value that should be included in a cryptographic operations to um, prove the freshness, so no replay attack has been performed. And then we include that nonce in the generated attestation report. So we can ask the AMD security processor to include a bit of, of, of data we can choose freely. And then we send that attestation report over to the server, and again, it can now verify both, both statements, and then use this to make stronger assertions about the agent joining our network. Yeah, and just like quick reminder, like how we verified this, right? So we used the uh, three keys that AMD issued to, to verify this, this report. All right. Live demo time. No, not recap, live demo. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope the font is big enough. If not, like, feel free to move to the front as well. Um, so I created uh, a VM in AWS just this morning for the sake of time because it takes like five or ten minutes. Um, but I just wanted to highlight like how easy it is to actually get a confidential VM from Amazon. You pay like a 10% markup. You say AMD SNP enabled and you're good to go. You get like memory encryption. There's no like create a key or like manage things. It, it, it's very user friendly at this point. Um, you need to keep two things in mind. Like they only have these machines in certain regions. So I, I think I had to go to like Ireland or something um, to get access. And they only support it for like certain machine types. So you can't get like half a core, half a gig of RAM. <clears throat> but yeah, that, that, that's it. And then the next thing is uh, we configure the, the Spiffy um, agent and server. So here, as I said, we have this metadata service, which we configure the endpoint for uh, in the agent. And then on the server side, again, we give it an access key to AWS, so it's actually able to talk to AWS and verify those claims the agent is making. Um, yeah, so what I did in the morning was just like Terraform apply, then upload these two config pieces, and what we can now do, 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 do. So we're logged in into the EC2 machine. That still works. Do, do, do. Oof, is the Wi-Fi just very slow? Maybe it's just that one. Okay, so we're already connected and I can just straight run the Spire server. Now conference Wi-Fi, please. <laughs> Now's the perfect time for questions if you have any. You can give me a quick second to fix this. Nice, thanks for saving me. I have a question, but I'm not sure if it's simple or short. Uh, I, I'm, I like your talk, it's super well presented. Uh, I can see that this is useful, I can see that it reduces the the attack surface. Mm -hmm. There's one thing which I which I don't understand. You you the whole the whole time you talk about, uh, there's this private key which you trust. There's this infrastructure which you trust, and then yeah. in the end it's called zero trust. I, yeah. I don't get that point. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, ma maybe I glossed over the fact of the, of the zero trust thingy, right? But zero trust is what the community is claiming to achieve by following these, this architecture of authentication authenticating and authorizing all network requests between different servers. My point is, and maybe not very well made, you claimed it to be zero trust, but at the same time you rely on these huge cloud native stacks where every component has like a direct impact on the security of like the authorization service you're running. Like, sorry, you can't claim this to be zero trust. And like what this approach aims to like at least reduce the attack surface, right? Get closer to zero trust. Um, Great, great question. Yeah. All right. So trusty mobile hotspot saved the day. Um, so reconnected uh, to the VM, started the, the Spiffy server. And just because I'm lazy, like I'm doing this on the same machine, obviously the server and the agent are supposed to run on two different, um, two different machines. All right, and then once we launch the agent, right, the agent checks like, am I already registered to the network? And if it is not, it will go to the server and request it to join, right? And here we can see like now it joined the network, it got one of these spiffy identifiers, which we can now use to uniquely identify the thing. And we can see the attestation request was completed on the server side. That's nice, that worked. And to actually look into it a bit, more detail what happened here. So we can use the Spire server CLI to, to query it about the state, right? Basically, which agents do you know about right now? So if I ask the Spire server to list me all the agents you know, all the ones that are registered, it says, yep, there's one that just joined the network like a minute ago. And this is the, the, the Spiffy ID. And if we query a bit more details about this, so I just pass out the, the Spiffy ID and then use a different command to get a lot more details, we see that all of these different selectors are now available. So these selectors are basically for the downstream users to decide whether they want to put trust or not into a system. So these are very simple key value pairs that we can now use to say like, okay, this instance runs on AWS, but it also runs on this hardened environment. I only trust these kinds to make connections to me because, the, I don't know, these are like the, the, the most critical parts of my system. Maybe they handle like PII information and stuff like that. All right. So as for the code, so I forked uh, the, the Spire project, which is one implementation of the Spiffy standard. Um, if we look into like the implementation, it, it, it's very slim. Like the most part is just setting up the gRPC messages that go back and forth. I extended the protocol, and then this is like the most critical part, right? Where we verify the attestation report. And here I'm, I'm just using the Go build and X509 libraries to to check the the validity of of the certificates. I'm fetching the two certificates from, from AMD, from the well-known endpoints, and then verify down to the report, and in the end, parse out some of these information into these selectors that are now attached to the instance. So we can see here, the measurement is taken from the report and added as metadata to the instance, and we can see this is the one I, I want to expect. So I recorded this earlier as like this trust on first use thingy, and we can see that these actually match, so <laughs> luck there. All right, we have six minutes for, for questions. Nice. Everyone's plenty confused. <laughs> I was just curious, in terms of the attestations you're getting from the CPU and, and basically using, as far as I can tell, uh, AMD as a trust anchor as yeah. for for minimizing the amount that you have to trust of the stack. Whether it would be possible to set up something that was in one of those enclaves, establish this sort of trust, um, and then exfiltrate the properties, or exfiltrate the data from that now trusted agent into one that is not trusted anymore. Um, like what? I, I, maybe, yes. maybe I'm unfamiliar <laughs> with with some of the um, the constraints that that um, these hardware facilities. 
cloud providers, but like what prevents AWS from, um, from say, taking an, an authenticated enclave and exfiltrating the data and then relaunching it basically in something that is now in an untrusted stack but has the right, has already done the right dance mm -hmm. to become an agent? Yeah. I'm not sure if I understand all facets of the question, but I try to answer a few. So what if AWS now takes one of these confidential VMs, right, with memory protection and just deploys it somewhere else? Um, this probably would work, as in, like, this, the same data in this protected context would make contact to the Spiffy server again. But still, the cloud provider is not able to access any of the data or, like, tamper with the workloads that are running inside of it, right? So we only get the, so in terms of CIA, we only get confidentiality and integrity. We don't get availability out of this. The cloud provider is still able to spin up and shut down the machine as, as they see fit. I mean, I think in this context, it's quite relevant to, to, to look at what's, what's actually being done and what is not, and I mean, on some level, you you can say they are they cannot lock into it. Yeah. But if they if they emulated everything, for instance, uh, including all the security measures, they they sure could. Yeah. So um, it's it's still. I mean, that's that's my previous point on the trust thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's 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 really misleading in the industry that people call this zero trust because you <laughs> yeah. fully need to trust your cloud provider. It's not like that this would go away. Um, uh, uh, and I mean. We've all probably watched the Matrix. Uh, that's basically the problem. You cannot know if this is, is if this is real or, or emulated. So I, I think what Zero Trust is trying to aim at is right these network connections. Right? Don't just implicitly trust your database or like that this service is allowed to talk to the database. Make it explicit. Right? Like give each of them an identity. Have a policy somewhere that says this service is allowed to talk to this database on port 80 stuff like that. So you can just like lock down your system more and more and like approach zero trust, I would say. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any more All questions? Right. If not, like feel free to approach me on the floor if you think of something. All right. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much.